If you would, turn with me to Ruth 3, Ruth chapter 3. <coughs> and for now, I'm going to read just verse 18. Ruth chapter 3, verse 18. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. <clears throat> I'm going to start with my grand finale today, if you will. But my title is, The Man Will Not Be in Rest. This statement, as you read it just in its historical context, may not tell you so much, maybe. Maybe it doesn't mean too much. But when we take it in the context in which it typifies, it is a comforting passage or verse. Now, from this statement or title, if you will, that I have given, it would be good to know who is this talking about or who does this typify and what is that for which he will have no rest till he finishes it? First of all, we have Naomi who cares about Ruth and is directing her to do something. Naomi, who I see as typifying the gospel of Christ being sealed to the heart of a believer by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God for His people directs them to do something. Sit still. Don't do anything. The matter is not up to you, so sit still. Exodus 14, 13 reads, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you to today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. We, as God's children, whether we have been brought to know, know it or not, have nothing to do with what needs to be done. We must wait on God. In verse 11, And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. We hear Boaz telling Ruth, who is his bride, his bride because he promised it would be so right here. This one, the near of kin, has promised to do to that one who has come to him at his feet that he would do something. So it is sure to be done. Ruth said to Boaz, spread forth thy skirt over me. For him to do this means he would marry her. This is him joining himself to Ruth. But let's remember, as we have seen coming through the book of Ruth, it becomes clear to us that Boaz is the Redeemer, the near of kin. In verse 1 we read, And Naomi had a kins... I'm in verse 1 of chapter 2, I'm sorry. And Naomi, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. It did not matter if those who were around knew him to be so at first at all. He was what he was before they knew he was what he was. Exactly. Remember Ruth, when she first went out to the fields to glean? She did not know who Boaz was, but he was still her, her redeemer, her near of kin. But there is a time when we finally are revealed that He is our Redeemer and we do come to Him. We adjoin ourselves to that one who we know is our only hope of redemption. We now know He is our near of kin and that He is the only one who could work out that redemption for us. So we inquire of Him. It's not like most do today and not like I have done previously before he revealed himself to me. I before, I thought I could do what pleased God. I agonized over it. I had sleepless nights over it. But then one day, it was revealed unto me. It is not what you do. 
It is just the fact that you have a kinsman redeemer who has already done it all. <clears throat> In coming to know this kinsman redeemer, I did not know a lot about him. I still know very little. But just as Naomi keeps pointing Ruth to the near of kin, the Spirit of God keeps telling me, this is the one with whom you need to deal with. You need to bow down to and you need to join yourself with him. But when it's all said and done, what is it that we are left with? Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. The immediate question in my mind is, what matter? The matter of redeeming a sinner. Now here in this passage is, being in the Old Testament, we can see this as something which was looking forward to something or happening or looking forward to that which was to be done. Those before Jesus Christ came looked forward in time to that day when the Messiah would come and redeem his people. We look back and see that day when it was done. He did redeem his people. Amen. But what is Ruth waiting on? There is a nearer kinsman that must be satisfied, and only the Redeemer can do it. He is the only one who can personally deal with this other kinsman. What he gives us to enable us to see these things is his grace, and it is abundant. Titus 3. If you would turn with me there if you want to follow along. Titus 3. Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly, through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Amen. God, when He does something for us, will openly manifest that He is doing something for us. What I mean by that is, it will leak out on you, and you will join yourself to His people, so it will manifest outwardly in that way. But Jesus Christ does not show openly how much faith he gives for, for one versus another. You cannot tell outwardly or by hearing and looking at one another how much of his gifts have been bestowed on each individual. Those to whom are in the family get to partake of those gifts and they may see the fruit of that gift, but they cannot know for another individual. Jesus Christ gives to each man severally as he wills. He bestows those gifts he is pleased to bestow in the measure he sees fit. That measure will be what the individual needs. We also read in Romans where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That is the time of love. Now if you would, turn with me to Ezekiel 16. I know I'm going back and forth here, but Ezekiel 16. Sixteen and verses eight through fourteen. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, the time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Then washed I thee with water. I thoroughly washed away the blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with bordered work, and shod thee with badger skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck. And I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk, embroidered work. 
thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper in, into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. <clears throat> Now let's read verses 6 through 8 in, in Ruth 3. 6 through 8 reads this, And she went down into, unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Although we do not necessarily see here what we might think of violence here, but this reminds me of a message that Mike Walker preached when he was here. The violent take it by force. Matthew eleven twelve says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Those who are of God, that is, those who are chosen of God, loved of God, born of God, called of God, will not be stopped, if you will. Not because they are unstoppable, but the grace of God working in them is unstoppable. It is that irresistible grace. Irresistible to the one shown grace and irresistible to anyone that might try to stop that grace of God being shown in one of his. She was going to do what was needed to be with Boaz. She knew that her only hope was that of him redeeming her. Men and women who are at this place are not violent because of anything they have or any power in them. They are violent because they are in need. They must have something, and that something is Jesus Christ the Lord. They are impoverished, and He is the only one who can provide. And I'm re reminded of a few accounts in Scripture that illustrate this to us. And you don't have to turn to these. I'll just tell you where they are, though. Blind Bartimaeus, Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Blind Bartimaeus heard Jesus was passing by, so he cried out, Jesus, thou son of David. What does he mean by saying it that way? He could have said Jesus of Nazareth, but he says, Jesus, thou son of David. This is that promised one, the seed of the woman, the son of David, the Messiah which was promised, the Redeemer. What does he say? Have mercy on me. Then it says, many charged him, is what it says. They were rebuking him for crying out to Jesus Christ. What they were saying to this, this man is, shut up. Yeah. Quit crying out. You are embarrassing. You're making a big deal out of this, and you need to be quiet. Mm -hmm. But those to whom this irresistible grace has been shed, they become violent when it comes to getting to their Redeemer and when you try to stop them. His people will not stop. No one else will stop them if this is of God, but they will take it by force. He cried the more and a great deal, it says. He cried louder and he did it more than before. He was not going to let his Redeemer pass by him. You will ignore everyone and will cry longer and louder. Those who have been bestowed this grace do not have to be talked into being here or somewhere else that preaches Christ and Him crucified. There are those who have been given this grace that will not let anyone keep them from where they can come into contact with Jesus Christ. Even if those who are already there under the sound of the gospel do not want them there. You cannot deter them because this kind of want to is from God. They will take it by force. Another one. Mark 5 verses 24 through 29. This is the woman with the issue of blood. She had this issue of blood 12 years. She suffered at the hands of those physicians, but they changed nothing for her that, that did nothing for her. 
This is what those who are religious do. Someone comes to them with trouble of soul. What do they tell people? Repeat after me. This is their remedy for a perishing soul. Repeat, repeat words after me. Take the first step. You take the wrong step and you could perish. Come to the front, to the altar, that place where there is nothing but death. The altar call. Roland spoke about that. Make your decision for Jesus. There is no decision for you to make. It is quite obvious. You have an issue of blood and you need someone who can stay the issue and save you. You cannot do it yourself and then there is no other to help. This world is about me, 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 me. They all make it about me or you. They all tell you to do something and not what someone else has done. Those who come to them leave having the same issue they had to begin with. But now they are left with nothing. They are worse than they were before. God will put you in that place where you have nowhere to turn, no one to go to, and nothing to offer. Now as Christ was on his way to the house of Jairus in that passage, many followed him, and they thronged him, it says. They were pressing hard against him. You know, it was kind of like this, you know, going back and forth on all sides as he walked. But Christ comes her way. This is a violent crowd. I think you could kind of see that. It's a violent crowd. I'm not saying it was a mad or angry violent crowd. Violence does not always include anger. If anyone's ever rode a roller coaster, especially those wooden ones, if you don't think that kind of thing is violent, you know, <laughs> you're, something's wrong with you. But there's a lot of sports you hear, and they say that's a violent sport. It's a physical force. These people were pressing and bumping up against Christ and others on all sides. So what does she do? She came in the press. She started to become violent herself because she had to get to Christ, her only hope. She had to be pushing everyone aside in violence as she came up through the crowd to get to Christ. Nothing was going to stop her from getting behind him and touching his garment. She push, pushed her way through the crowd and she touched him. All it takes is contact with the master and you will know you're cleansed. It says straightway or immediately her issue of blood was gone. Amen. But the master knows them that touch him in this way. How do they touch him? In need. Knowing he can accomplish it if he is willing. Yeah. One more example, and if you would, I want you to turn to this one. Genesis 32. All these are familiar to you, but Genesis 32. This is Jacob who wrestles with the man. 32, 24 through 26. Twenty-four through twenty-six. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. When Jacob was alone, and it says a man wrestled with him, this man touched the hollow of his thigh and when this was done. His thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him, it says. His thigh bone was out of joint with his hip. Something like that. I don't know exactly how you would say it, but it was out of place. Put his bone out of place. It hurt. It, there was pain there. God will cause you to suffer in that you will see that he is far superior to yourself. This man told Jacob to let him go. But Jacob would not let him go. He said, not until you bless me. Yeah. Although he was wounded, he knew he needed blessing from this man. Yeah. This man being Jesus Christ the Lord. God's people, when God has done something for them, will not stop until they get to Christ. 
This they do by His mighty power and grace when He wrestles with them. This is violent. Them knowing He has the power to do all things, they know what He has promised to do. Now that one who has been given life by God and revealed unto them who their Redeemer is, it is always a who, and it is only one who that is revealed. In type we see the who here in the book of Ruth as Boaz. But we know the object from whom that shadow was cast is Jesus Christ the Lord. Yes. That one who has been revealed will come to the feet of their Savior and Redeemer in the hopes that he will do for them what they know the Redeemer can do. What do they do? They ask to be covered in his righteousness. Join me, an outsider, a sinner, in the garment of your righteousness. This one we come to know is our near of kin. Yeah, yes, Verses 9 through 12 in Ruth 3. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou, thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning insomuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Here we read there is a kinsman nearer, than this that must be satisfied. The law of God must be satisfied first. Yeah. Yes, I cannot satisfy the law. Exactly. I am unable. Why? I am not a near of kin. I'm an outsider. I am from Moab. Yes. I have nothing I can offer. I have experienced death all around me and I am in need of a redeemer to do something for me on my behalf. But this one who is our Redeemer will go and work out that which is to be done on my behalf, since I am unable to do it. He promises to do what needs to be done, even if the nearer of kin does not do it. So then we come back to wait. Wait on him for those promises. This is, of course, being in the Old Testament looking forward to that day when he would perform that duty of a near of kin. We now look back to when he has done the duty of the near kin. It says in verse 13, it says, Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part, kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then I will do the part of the kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth. What is this tied to? But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, that is the law, then will I do a part, the part of a kinsman. That is Christ. As the Lord liveth. Does the Lord liveth? Most assuredly. What he has promised, he will carry out and in fact has carried it out. Ezekiel 12, 25 says, For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged for in your days. O rebellious house, will I say the word, and I will perform it, saith the Lord God. He confirms to us what here in Ruth 3 he will be do, do looking forward. But now what he confirms to us is what he has done by giving us the earnest of his spirit. That confirms these things to our hearts which have been created by God. He will give us that which testifies to what he will and has done. It will be enough for us while we wait on him. Sustainment until that day. We rest in him. This is what this means to his people today. Rest in Jesus Christ the Lord, for he has accomplished that for which he promised to do, for which he came to do. 
He has redeemed his people from their sins. He hath clothed us in his robe of righteousness, covered us with his skirt. He gives us these things in the gospel as a reminder to us that we await his return to glorify us in what he has done. Even so come, Lord Jesus, is the cry of his people. My near of kin, does God wrestle with you? If so, what is your response to him? Is it to wrap your arms around him to not let go? Or is that too hard for you? It is all the believer knows to do. May we come to that place where we can say as Job does by the Spirit of God, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Amen.